Hey, Margie here. Are you ready to explore some hidden or not well-known root causes of osteoporosis and other health conditions you might be experiencing? Well, if the answer is yes, you are in the right place because our special guest today is Dr. Peter Kozlowski, also known as Dr. Koz. And as a functional medicine physician, Dr. Koz uses a broad array of tools to find the source of the body's dysfunction. And he takes the time to listen to his patients and plots their history on a timeline. And he considers what makes them unique and co-creates with them a truly individualized care plan. Currently, he works with patients online and in person via his Chicago, Illinois, or Bozeman, Montana offices. Dr. Kozlowski did his residency in family practice, but started training in functional medicine as an intern. And he's trained in clinics with leaders in the field of functional medicine, including Dr. Mark Hyman, Dr. Deepak Chopra, and Dr. Susan Blum. And in today's interview, we really delve into some issues that are, are really not looked at. We go into heavy metals, SIBO, and other things that might be underlying causes of osteoporosis, as well as other health conditions. So it's really full of great information. And we also touch on the emotional, spiritual piece, which is so very important. So stay tuned. Welcome, Dr. Kaz. It's such a thrill to have you on the podcast. So welcome, welcome. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here. You know, I always like to hear about the backstory, you know, how you got into being your family physician trained and how you got into functional medicine and why you practice this really wonderful approach that I love, you know, mind, body, spirit. But how did that all start? Yeah, my story is a little bit different than most physicians uh, that go functional medicine. And usually it's because they got sick and they're not getting better. So then they find functional medicine. My story is a little different. Um, my family's uh, like you, there's a lot of physicians in my family. My parents are both doctors, um, grandparents. Um, so very, but very traditional trained. And I went through medical school got in a residency and was very kind of closed minded and just kind of follow the rules that I was taught. And my own personal story that I talk about in my book is that I'm in recovery. So I, I talk about a lot about trauma and my trauma as a kid was my, I'm a first generation American. So, and that in itself is not traumatic, but I created trauma in my head by just never feeling good enough, feeling awkward. Um, just constantly wanting to fit in. And so when I got into high school, the way that I found to fit in was alcohol. And then I tried to quit alcohol when I uh, started residency. And I found that I couldn't figure out how to do life without alcohol in my life. So I went to treatment uh, when I was an intern in residency and spent six weeks um, in a treatment. And that changed my life for many reasons. I mean, personally, but then also professionally, because the biggest shock in treatment was that it had nothing to do with alcohol. It was all about our mental, emotional, spiritual health and why are reasons that you drink. Um, so that experience, I came back from residency or I came back from treatment. I went to, back to residency and we had, uh, as a family practice doctor, you do different rotations every month. So you, you do focus on cardiology one month, inpatient medicine, outpatient medicine, OB. Um, so every month you're doing something different. And when we're on inpatient, there's a different attending every week and they all have a different style. And so we had this one doctor, Dr. Batra, who whenever somebody was hospitalized would start a multivitamin and vitamin D. And we thought it was ridiculous. Like we as residents would make fun of him. We're like, why are you wasting our time to put in these orders? Um, what's the point? Nobody else is doing this. And so that kind of went on. And then one day I was on call with him and it was like two o'clock in the morning on a Sunday night, we're in the hospital. And I kind of just asked him like, why are you weird? And, and he's like, I'm studying functional medicine. And I was like, what is that? I don't know what that is. And he showed me the website. I looked into it. He told me about it. And so I signed up for the main conference, um, AFMCP, which is a week long conference introducing functional medicine. And within the first hour, I just knew that my career could never be the same. 
And because mostly because it was taught from like a biochemistry physiology level to where you like, I don't know, it, prior to that experience, I would have just said that natural medicine or alternative medicine is just made up. Like people are just making it up. And all of this was evidence-based. So I was like, why not look at the world this way? And at that conference, there was physicians and, and practitioners from every background. I was talking to cardiologists, ophthalmologists, neurologists, and I'm like, what are you guys doing here? And everybody I spoke to, and I was still, I mean, I was one of the youngest people there, I think. I mean, I just started residency. And they were all like, this is the future of medicine. This is what you need to do. If you haven't started like your career yet, this is what you should do. So that I went home from that week and I just kind of processed it more. I started seeing more patients in my outpatient clinic and I just saw that I wasn't really helping anyone. I mean, I was giving pills to bring down an A1C or bring down blood pressure, but I didn't really feel like I was helping anyone. So functional medicine, I was just like, I'm going to pursue this. And so I went all in and, and just devoted myself. And luckily my residency program supported me. I did away rotations with at Dr. Hyman's clinic, Dr. Blum's clinic, at Dr. Chopra's clinic. So I got to learn functional medicine from the best people and then apply it myself. And then I've been off on my own since 2014. Oh, so that's, I, that's my story. I love the story. How lucky for you as a resident, because most residents are not exposed to this and not lucky, but I truly believe there's always a silver lining to everything. So your history with past trauma and the alcoholism really can help you help patients. That's so incredible that you've been able to use that in terms of a strength in order to pass down the lessons that you've learned. Wow. More than anything, it opened my mind. I, I think if I didn't go through that personal experience before I went to treatment, I was so closed minded and thought I had it all figured out and you know, just very egotistical. So that experience humbled me and that allowed me to be open to functional medicine when it was presented to me. Right. So, but even more than that, because you can be a functional medicine doctor and not truly embrace the emotional, spiritual component. So I think yeah. that's fabulous that you also, and that's something that is very near and dear to me too, but I love how you bring that piece to your treatment as well. Yeah. So we have so many things to explore, but let's, yeah. let's first, let's just talk about because a lot of people are listening are very interested in their bone health, but what mm -hmm. applies to the bones applies really to everything. But I know when we were talking beforehand, you had some things, because you look at things a little differently when you evaluate mm -hmm. people, but in terms of the bones from your experience, when people come in wanting to prevent osteoporosis or if they have osteoporosis, what are certain things that you do that maybe they're traditional when they just go to their internist isn't looking at that you think could be important? Yeah. So in we I definitely work with people from all ages and, and backgrounds and, and diagnoses. And for the most part, I tell people, I'm like, I don't care that much what your diagnosis is. What we're looking for is what does your body have too much of? Are you inflamed? And inflammation can present differently in different people. So we could have the same underlying condition like candida, um, but our symptoms are different. So the five main areas that we look are food, gut health, hormones, toxins, and mental, emotional, spiritual health. And the whole point of my book is that the most important of those is mental, emotional, spiritual health. But so then, I mean, it's when I have certain diagnoses, there's certain areas I'm going to start in the functional medicine model. And when I have, when I'm talking about bone health, I, the most preventative thing someone can do is detox from heavy metals. So toxins, when we talk about toxins, they could be heavy metals, they can be um, mold mycotoxins, it could be glyphosate, it could be stress, it could be trauma. These are all different toxins. Toxins are fat soluble. So when we breathe them in, drink them, abs absorb them, they get stored in our body unless they go through the liver, through this two-phase process, making them water soluble, and then we pee, poop, and sweat them out. And metals, specifically for osteoporosis, 
we're, we're all being exposed. So the biggest, the number one risk that all of us have is that you could have been born with a high level of, of metals because if mom had them, they can pass through the placenta and you could be born with it and not know. Um, lead is in airplane exhaust, pipes, paint, um, foods, fish is, or excuse me, mercury is high in fish, vaccines, dental fillings. So these are typical exposure sources. And it's kind of like when I talk about metals, just being alive in 2021 is a risk factor for having a high level of metals. Um, they, they're everywhere and they accumulate differently in all of us. Part of the, the, how much they accumulate is dependent on our genetics and then also our lifestyle. So if you're just exposed to metals, you might have an easier job of getting rid of them. But let's say you're exposed to metals, mold, um, your gut is imbalanced. And so you've got this bucket, the analogy I use is a bucket. And we fill that bucket with these different toxins. And eventually when that bucket overflows, it overflows into disease. And so one of the favorite place for metals to accumulate is in the bones. So to me, if I, I, I always would love to see people before they've gotten sick, right? But 99% of patients that come into my office already have disease. And it's, then it's, it's more of a struggle. I mean, we definitely have had results in people improving their bone health, healing from autism, eczema, all these different things that we talk about in my book. Um, but the getting at the underlying cause is the key. And when it comes to bone health, to me, I would pick metals and mold and just toxins as something that can just store in your bones and eventually cause them to deteriorate. So that's very interesting. So when someone comes in, then that would be part of your workup you know, testing for heavy metals, as well as testing for mold? It, heavy metals, we, we can all be tested for. I don't, I don't need to hear anything in, their his, in someone's history. If their specific goal is like osteoporosis prevention, then I'm definitely doing it. Mold is, not some, mold is something that um, really based on symptoms, or excuse me, exposure history. So, and my exposure, I mean, most people don't know that they've lived in mold. Um, very few do. My best screening question that I use for mold is, has your house ever had water damage? Mm. And if you've had water damage and then you've got some kind of bone issues, immune issues, neurologic issues, hormonal issues, um, that will, I will recommend testing you for mold. Um, but I don't, I mean, with metals, I would, I could, I can make an argument that anybody should be tested with mold. Sometimes I don't, I mean, if there's really, really no exposure history, I don't think it's worth it. Okay, great. And just, a lot of people have different types of testing they like. Is there a certain type of testing that you prefer for the, I mean, you know, there's lots of options to get sure. to the same answer, but is there one that. So what I've used my whole career is, is pre and post chelation testing, Okay. which is urine testing pre-test it's two tests on one day. And in the pre-test, you basically just pee in a cup and that measures your active exposure. So is there something in your current environment that is high in uh, toxins that you need to get rid of? Because the first step in detox is to stop exposure. If we don't, if we're trying to detox you and your water is still full of lead, we're not going to get anywhere. So the pre-test is to, to determine current exposure. Then you take a dose of DMSA, which is a medication, a chelating agent that pulls toxins out of your tissues. After you take that medicine, you collect your urine for six hours. That DMSA is pulling what's stored out and we're collecting it in your urine. And then we compare how much was stored to how much was your active exposure. And if it's stored, then that's somebody, depending on their levels, that I'd probably recommend to detox from. I just worked with someone this morning who she was really questioning. She's like, well, when did these get there? How did they get there? And that unfortunately is impossible for me to diagnose unless you, unless like heavy metal testing becomes part of our standard of care as a, you know, routine when you go to your yearly uh, physical, if they tested for that, then we'd have some history. But most people are coming in, they're in their 
30s, 40s, 60s, 70s, and it's in they've never had any of this testing. So if the pretest is negative, all I can say is you're not being exposed now. And I have no clue when this got here. I mean, unless there's something really specific in their history, but it's, it's really difficult to determine when exactly it got there. Oh, well, great. Well, thanks for enlightening us to this because I've had people on the podcast because it is important and it's something that is not when you go to your doctor with osteoporosis, it's not one of the first, it's probably not even in the repertoire of things no. to look at quite honestly. No. Yeah. But you've seen major things when people do detox in terms of improving. If, yeah, if I could pick just one thing, it would be that. Oh, very interesting. Wow. Yeah. So let's get on because your book, Unfunk with a C <laughs> is, is really great. And I loved reading it because, as I said, I loved your approach. But one of the um, case studies you talked about, someone with eczema, uh -huh. and you talked about the organic acids test that you use, uh -huh. oats. And I just wanted to, because that's something else with people. Well, let's, I guess, let, let, maybe we should continue with what you were talking about and maybe bring in that piece because, so someone who else comes to you with osteoporosis, you're going to, first, you said the toxins and the heavy metals. What other testing do you think is really important that you found to be something that may be overlooked in traditional, you know, medical care? Yeah. So like Hippocrates said a few thousand years ago, all disease begins in the gut and that does not uh, disclude our bones. Our bones health is affected by our gut health. Um, so that's really the focus of my book. And in most people, that's where we're starting. I had a, a, a patient I was working with yesterday who's we're working on uh, osteoporosis is we've been working on her gut for a couple of years and now her gut is better. And that's longer. I mean, usually we don't, we usually we can get someone's guts balanced in more in a few months, but um, now that her gut is healed, we're going to look at toxins, but the gut, right. And, and the big thing we talk about in functional medicine is your microbiome, the bacteria that grow in your gut. And those bacteria can be good, which is like probiotics, or that bacteria can be imbalanced, which is dysbiosis dysbiosis can be due to bacteria, yeast, candida, parasites, all these different things can overgrow our guts. And my favorite analogy to think about your microbiome is it's like your own garden. And in that analogy, the probiotics are the plants of your garden. Fiber is the fertilizer of your garden. But what happens when you don't take care of a garden is weeds grow, right? And let's say like, I mean, one of the worst things for your microbiome is antibiotics. Antibiotics are tablets or capsules that were designed to kill bacteria. Where do we put them? In a tube that has five pounds of bacteria in it. So if your garden, you um, doused it in some kind of toxins, the plants will die. And if you don't do anything about it, weeds will grow. And that's what happens in our guts. You take a course of antibiotics, you don't do anything to fix your gut afterwards. And then all these different weeds that we're being exposed to start growing. The, in regards to like organic acid testing. So if someone wants to do a comprehensive look at their large intestine specifically, which is where your microbiome is, there's two tests that I use. And the first one is stool testing, a comprehensive stool analysis. And the second one is an organic acids test. The stool test is gonna tell us basically what is growing in your garden. Do you have probiotics? Do you have weeds? Candida is a yeast that can overgrow your gut. And candida unfortunately tends to die in the stool. So we get a lot of false negatives in the stool. So in an organic acids test, it is measuring the breakdown of candida, a marker called aribinose. So if the breakdown of candida is high in your urine, that is another way to diagnose candida. So that the, the main value in the organic acid test from a gut perspective is that. Um, the other one is, is looking for elevations in, in pathogenic clostridia bacteria. There's hundreds of species of Clostridia. Um, the most common one that people are familiar with is called Clostridium difficile. Uh, it's the diarrhea that people get in the hospital, but there's lots of different species of Clostridia. 
your basic stool analysis isn't going to tell you what kind of clostridia is growing, but an organic acids test will. Um, stool test will also look at how well you're digesting, um, how well you're absorbing your food, how inflamed your gut is, how well your gut bacteria are eating, and if you have parasites. A really cool thing that they do is if they find weeds that are known to cause disease, like candida, they will do sensitivity testing on it. So they will treat what's growing inside you with different herbs and antibiotics to see what kills what's growing inside you. So we can really target our treatment. The organic acid test beyond the gut component of it also tells us about our mitochondrial health. Right, the mitochondria are the powerhouse of our cells. They're they're abundant in all of our different cells, but they're basically where we turn food into energy. And the mitochondria can be inflamed um, due to toxins, due to poor gut health, uh, due to medications like statins. So mitochondrial health can just tell you more about someone's metabolic health. Um, Organic acid test also looks at how well you're utilizing fat for energy, uh, B vitamin levels, uh, mitochondrial vitamin levels like NAC and CoQ10. Um, and then it also has glutathione levels, which glutathione is our master antioxidant. And if someone's glutathione is depleted and we haven't yet done toxin testing, that could be a sign to me, hey, we need, even though th there was nothing in their history that said we need to do toxin testing, their glutathione is depleted, Let's, we might need to look at toxins. So that the stool and the organic acid test, specifically looking at the large intestine are the most important tests to order. The third test for a complete gut picture is SIBO testing. SIBO stands for small intestine bacterial overgrowth and is actually the most common thing that I treat when I'm working with someone's gut. What it means is basically your gut bacteria have moved from your large intestine into your small intestine. And that's a really bad thing because your small intestine is where you should be digesting and absorbing your nutrients. Your small intestine should be lined with microvilli that increase the surface area and give you this huge absorptive space. They should, your microvilli should not be covered in bacteria. And so even if they're good or bad, the bacteria just shouldn't be there. And SIBO, most people with SIBO have gut symptoms, but I've seen a number of people over the years that have su just systemic symptoms, canker sores, rectal itching, rashes, eczema, that with no GI symptoms, but we find SIBO, we get rid of it, and those systemic issues go away. Wow, that's it's so interesting because I've also recently seen a lot more people with SIBO. And I think a lot of people would be diagnosed with quote IBS and they didn't go further to test for SIBO. Um, but it is something that's become quite prevalent. And so do you routinely do you do the breath testing? How do you how are you checking for SIBO? So I do two hour lactulose breath test. Um, you basically drink a little solution of lactulose, which is a sugar and one of the favorite foods of your gut bacteria. <laughs> After you drink that, you blow into a little balloon every 20 minutes for two hours. In that first two hours, the lactulose is passing from your mouth, esophagus, stomach, and small intestine. Those parts of your gut should be clean, mostly of bacteria, a very small amount, not enough to um, blow out gas. So when we're the, the SIBO testing, what we're measuring in those balloons is hydrogen and methane gases. Your bacteria, when they eat, it is an anaerobic process. So without oxygen. So it creates gas when your gut bacteria are eating. So by giving you lactulose, if your gut bacteria have moved up from your large intestine and into your small intestine, you're going to start blowing out gas. And that's not normal. And that's what that's how we diagnose SIBO. I've seen a number of practitioners use three hour breath testing, which I absolutely cannot make sense of because somewhere around minute 120, the, the lactulose has passed into your large intestine. 
So your levels of hydrogen and methane are going to be huge because we're in the large intestine and now you have gut bacteria and they're fermenting. So I've always stuck to the two hour breath test. Okay. Is that something? So if someone's working with you, because people listening and, and it, it is available now at a lot of even conventional centers now are offering, you know, the SIBO testing, which is, with, and the breath test, which is great. But can people also do that online? Can people, you know, is that something that can be sent to their house or do they need to go somewhere? The one you like? The one that I use, so I use a lab called Genova Diagnostics and we are mostly working virtually now with people. So when we want to do testing, we just ship you the test. You do the test at home. Um, the test comes with a bag from FedEx. You ship it right back to the lab. I get the results and then I forward them to the person. Oh, that's so great. It, yeah, we've, we've always used at-home testing. Um, and it, it's probably the test out of like stool, urine, metals, the stuff that we test for, people are usually the most intimidated by the breath test because it's like, oh, am I going to screw this up? There's like a 90 second YouTube video that shows you how to do it. And it it's very easy to do. So interesting. So when, when I, what I think is fascinating is that you don't have to have gut symptoms. And I think that people are always shocked about, you know, yeah. like some of your examples in the book, you have eczema, you have something else, and here you have a problem such as SIBO or some other issue that, you know, you're, you feel you don't have any problems with diarrhea or constipation or stomach issues. So, you know, it can affect anywhere, your weakest link, I guess. But yeah, yeah. so but how often do you, is, is that something that down the road or almost right away, you'll, you'll test for these different things? So when someone comes in to see me, the first thing that they do is before their visit, they fill out like 40 pages of medical history. And I, I spend quite a bit of time before the initial visit going through that. And a lot of times I have a, then a pretty good idea of which direction I'm gonna wanna go in, in regards to looking for underlying causes. Um, so it's, it's usually determined um, at the first visit, once I meet the person, we start talking. It's definitely not something that I order in everybody. And usually if there are, I mean, I feel like I kind of just got lucky in finding that these people that have just the systemic issues, because it's not really the way you're taught, but clinically I'd have these people that weren't getting better. And I'm like, you know what? I, I, I don't really know why, but we're kind of out of options. Why don't we test for SIBO and, <laughs> and see? And luckily through doing that, I mean, I learned and seeing people heal these systemic issues. Um, I now have it higher up in my thought process. Like if there's something strange going on that we can't explain, um, SIBO testing is, is a pretty good option. And if you've got like the traditional IBS symptoms, then you're probably definitely getting the test. Another way that someone could test themselves actually at home, SIBO I tried to write about in my book because it, it's the most common thing I see, but also because our general understanding of gut health is a disaster for SIBO. Because if you tell one of your friends you've got gut issues, usually what they tell you to do is to get a probiotic and to eat more fiber. And if you have SIBO, you're going to get worse because the point of a probiotic and the point of fiber is to grow more gut bacteria. When you have SIBO, that's the last thing that you want to be doing is growing more bacteria. So I've seen a number of people over the years with SIBO that get better just by going on a low FODMAP diet, which we have recipes for, and by stopping their probiotic. And that, that conversation is, I've seen it many times where I'm telling someone about this and they just, I've seen people break into tears because it's like, so you're telling me everything I've been doing for the last five years has been backwards. And sometimes the answer is yes, if you have SIBO. And so that, that's why I'm trying to get that knowledge out there that um, this is something that can be addressed and usually pretty easily, um, but it's just way underdiagnosed. So interesting because I, I think a good point for everybody listening is you can't do what your friend tells you or yeah. you're hearing. I, I like how you put it in your book. 
about people are just too much into Google and just, you know, the internet's amazing. I mean, we can have, I, I love having the podcast because I spread information, but you have to be careful because what works for one person could be poison for you. And probiotic, which is so amazing for the average person, but you're right. If you have SIBO, it's going to exacerbate your symptoms and you won't even know because you've been taking it for five years. How do you have any idea that that's something that's not really helping you? Because right. yeah, yeah. So that's yeah, such a good it's, point. It's, it's shocking for people to learn that and experience that. Um, and you but... do such a good job in the book about SIBO, but it is something that's not, I think it's getting more and more recognized, but typically it's, it's not. A lot of times, yeah. you know, people, it's not the first thing. And how interesting though, to me, that because you've been as a last resort, <laughs> you know, yeah. when you initially, but you've been finding that it's so prevalent and yeah. that you now, are there certain other symptoms? I mean, you talked about some of the other things, the canker sores, but typically, because I think there are typical symptoms that people just may not be aware of Skin. anyone listening. So why don't you tell us like, you know, what are some things when you're hearing their history, like that really tips you off? This could be SIBO. Skin issues. And so I always say that the, the best representation of your gut is your skin. So that's where your gut kind of shines exteriorly. Um, so eczema, rashes, um, osteoporosis, or excuse me, um, eczema, rashes, psoriasis, these kind of common skin conditions, um, people, that's the most common one. So I have a girl that I was working with the other day that her skin is getting better. And it, they're always, people are always kind of shocked. Like <laughs> I wasn't even having gut symptoms, but I, you know, I trusted you. I took a chance and like my skin's better. And I'm like, yeah, it's crazy. Um, Can but, I just say something about that? It's so yeah. interesting because when you work with osteoporosis, that's what people come to see me for. And unfortunately, yeah, sort of unfortunately, it's not as though you can say, oh yeah, I'm feeling better because a lot of times yeah. that, that's actually asymptomatic. They don't notice that, yeah. but they do have other things, you know, yeah. and they didn't think those were even an issue, you know, whether it's the bowels or whether it's eczema. I see so many people with eczema and, and arthritis, you know, that they just think they have to live with this. I'll use some cream, no big deal. So I think that's one of the things that when it gets better, I'm like, you know what, your health, things are getting better. It's just something that you can, you know, that it's nice. It's, but people just don't realize it, but it, it, that's and it's an amazing way to start connecting the dots, right? You've got somebody yeah. with eczema and osteoporosis and the, the traditional doctor is going to tell you, use this cream and then take this pill and, you know, completely focusing on separate sym uh, symptoms and, and systems. But it, in a lot of people, it all started with their gut and what they're eating and what's growing in their gut and how they're treating their gut. And, but it all connects. Um, another one is fibromyalgia. Wait, can we just go back to the yeah. SIBO? Oh, oh, another one for SIBO is fibromyalgia. Yeah. Oh, okay, continue. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's- Yeah, another, another condition that my- testing rate is actually a hundred percent of patients that I've tested who have Wait, fibromyalgia. Excuse me. A hundred percent in my practice. Yeah. <gasps> That's it's, unbelievable. I mean, there's usually other, like in all of these conditions, I mean, our, our traditional medical model is so focused on like, this definitely causes that, or this definitely causes that. My experience is, is it's, it's a combination of things. Um, but fibromyalgia and SIBO are so, so connected. Um, and that kind of proves the point that when your microbiome has overgrown and what's happening and, and, and the biggest thing that I, I try to teach people is the gut is the gateway into the body. You have this gut tube that starts with the mouth and ends with the anus. There's openings on both ends. So this is just one long tube that runs through your body. The inside of that tube is actually considered outside of your body. So if you swallow something and poop it out, it's never been in your body, right? My dogs like to play with balloons. And sometimes if I don't catch the balloon after they pop it, they'll swallow it and they'll poop it out. And we did, they, that never went in their body, right? Corn is something that people frequently see if they eat. So 
in so the gut is a barrier into and and that's where that term leaky gut that most people have heard of comes in and it's basically deciding what comes in and what stays out well if you've got these bad bacteria overgrowing what happens is they release toxins into your body and your immune system starts responding so on the other side of your gut tube is the bloodstream tube so things either get in or stay out and once they're in, now they're inside. And what happens with your blood? It goes everywhere, right? From your head to your toes. That is why, I mean, you can take a hundred people with a gluten sensitivity or SIBO or candida or parasites, and they literally all have different symptoms because that inflammation has gotten into the bloodstream and it just goes everywhere. And one of the favorite places for it to go is joints and bones too. So- such um, such important information. So, uh, okay, so we have fibromyalgia. We have eczema. Any other ones that we should alert people to? That brain you see? fog, neurologic okay. symptoms, numbness. No, nobody has brain. nobody has that brain fog. No, I'm just yeah, using. Right. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, great. Yeah, you, you. I mean, joint pain. Um, if somebody was like came to me and they were like, "Listen, I I want to." find whatever might be on filling my bucket um, that could lead me to have osteoporosis. SIBO would definitely be, I mean, if, if they want to do testing, we can do it. And it's definitely a thing that could contribute to like something like osteoporosis happening down the road. Great. One question that I, I want to ask you a few more things, but one question I do have with SIBO is so often what I see, not what I've seen in the past is that people were treated with an antibiotic, which, which mm. does, but then it reoccurs. I mean, it that's what I've usually. seen. Yeah. What I've seen so often is because now really traditional conventional medicine doctors do treat SIBO and they do treat them with the antibiotic that's effective. But a lot of times there's other issues that continue that haven't been addressed. So then it just comes back. Is that what you see? And what's your thought on that? Yeah, that's a great, great point. Um, the, the funniest thing that I see is people that have seen GI doctors and the GI doctor has told them to do a low FODMAP diet. And they're, they're like, I have no clue why this works, but I've seen it work in other patients. Um, or rifaximin, they're like, you know, you're having IBS symptoms. Let's try this antibiotic. I don't really know why, but let's just do it. And I mean, that's the one, that's what people have been put on and it works. Yes. I mean, yes. what I've seen, it absolutely works, but then it, it, what I've seen, unless they're on a program or working with someone, it will come back because the so root cause So usually yeah. what I've seen is, I, I mentioned that you can either have hydrogen gas or methane gas or both. People that are hydrogen positive, just hydrogen positive, tend to be very, very responsive to rifaximate. And it tends to work and doesn't come back necessarily. If you are just methane positive or both, antibiotics, you, when, when I have someone that's methane positive, I'm also adding in a second antibiotic called neomycin if this is the route that they want to go. Got it. Um, and I, everybody though that I work with that is methane positive, I usually try to steer them away from antibiotics and to go with natural antibiotics. And like, I was just working with someone this morning also with this and the difference, one main difference is, is that the natural approach that I follow takes nine weeks. Usually antibiotics is two weeks. And so this person's like, you know what? I, I just want something that's fast. And I'm like, listen, the, this, you might feel better. You might get worse. I've seen people that go into remission with just antibiotics that are methane positive, but it's less likely to happen. Got it. Okay. So, so I mean, we, we yeah. try to do natural herbs and antibiotics support the gallbladder, support digestion. And then if that fails, you take antibiotics, you take herbs multiple times, you've done the low FODMAP diet. And if that all fails, then our kind of what I call our nuclear option is the elemental diet, yeah. which is just a liquid diet for two weeks, uh, two to three, depends on uh, the person. Um, I don't well, like to news. start yeah. people with that because it's hard, right? It's, it's really hard to not eat for two weeks. 
Um, I do intermittent fasting twice a week. And I mean, those days are hard for me. So a, a full two or three weeks is really difficult. Well, I think the good news is that there's treatment and it's another thing to look at, you know, if you're, if you're not getting better and you have fibromyalgia and you have other things in addition to your bones, it's a, it's a root cause and something that people can explore. And I think yeah. that it's important to, that you brought it out. Before we end though, I do want to, cause I want something I love about you and your practice is the spiritual and you combine the emotional. So what practices, like what daily routines? I know it's a big piece of the work you do as well as the work I do. So why don't you tell us what you found effective and what you include with yeah. your patients? So the, for people that haven't read my book yet, the, the big secret that I reveal to gut health, I'm going to spoil it, is your <laughs> mental, emotional, spiritual health. And that is also based on science. So that's not kind of just made up. Um, your gut is lined with its own nervous system called the enteric nervous system. It's got 200 to 250 million neurons in it more than anywhere else in your body. That nervous system is connected to your brain by the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve is a cranial nerve that runs from your brain to your gut. The vagus nerve runs on your autonomic nervous system. Your autonomic nervous system is divided into sympathetic response and parasympathetic response. Sympathetic is our fight or flight response. So these are things that are happening that we're not really thinking about. Um, I live in Montana now. So let's say I'm hiking and we encounter a bear. My sympathetic nervous system is going to get activated. I need to get out of there. The blood is going to go to my brain and to my muscles to escape. When I'm sitting by the campfire at night, I'm relaxed and my parasympathetic nervous system is activated. Rest and digest. So the sympathetic response is extremely damaging to your gut and people don't know it. You have no clue. Like you feel stress, you feel trauma, you feel anxiety, but then for a long time, you don't feel the gut symptoms and then the gut symptoms can start. And so for most of us, I actually think it starts in childhood, um, with trauma and, um, trauma, the best definition I've heard of it is anything less than nurturing. And most people think of trauma as very serious events. For me, it's, it's just most of us have experienced some kind of it. So the mental, emotional, spiritual component, again, this is kind of my own experience with recovery and thinking I was perfect and then finding out that I was completely messed up. And um, I had to learn mental, emotional, spiritual health. Um, but then... I'm also a perfectionist, which is a gift and a curse, but the only patients that I really think about are the ones that are not getting better and what, what's not happening. What are we not doing? And so what I've seen over the years, the big thing that I've noticed is when their mental, emotional, spiritual health is out of whack, their gut won't heal. So I try to have every patient that's working with me work with a therapist, um, cognitive behavioral therapy, an amazing tool is EMDR therapy for trauma. It's basically using eye movement to get into your neuronal networks to treat trauma without having to talk about it. It's, it's been amazing to see people heal that way. Um, Can I just ask you a question about that? Mm -hmm. um, who, if someone's listening, how would they find a practitioner in that or how would they... There's a website, I, I can share it with you and maybe you could share it at the end. Um, sure. That, that you can search for certified practitioners. Oh, okay. You know what? I'll put that in the show notes. Perfect. Thank you. Perfect. Yeah. Just remind me, my, my assistant Jasmine can, mm -hmm. has it. we'll get it. No problem. <laughs> yeah. Um, sorry, where were we going? Oh, so we were, you were going into the, the therapy uh, and yeah. 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 So therapy is something that I really encourage people to do very, a lot of resistance. People are like, I'm not crazy. Um, I don't need to go to a therapist. I think we're all nuts. Um, we're either dealing with it or we're not. So uh, a therapist for me helped me figure out the things like me just not feeling good enough in my own skin and that relating to me being an immigrant. Um, and that took a lot of work. It's like a, an example they use is like an onion and peeling the layers of the onion. And sometimes it's hard to peel them on your own. Um, meditation, um, the biggest problem with meditation I see is people quit. They're like, I tried it. 
I, my mind was all over the place. I'm not good at it. There's no point. Studies have shown that you get the health benefits from being in that space. It doesn't matter if your mind's all over the place or not. And it's a muscle. It, it, it gets better over time. There's good days. When I go to the gym, there's days that I feel stronger. There's days that I feel weaker with meditation. It's the same thing. Some days are great. I'm like, wow, why can't it be like this every day? Some days are a complete disaster. I'm like, what, what happened here? Um, I really like the app calm. I actually learned that from a few patients. I kept getting it recommended to me. I was, I tried it out. There's a really good series on there by a guy named Jeff Warren. It's called how to meditate. So he kind of takes you through 30 days of learning the ins and outs and, and kind of learning about the things that would make people give up that shouldn't make you give up. Um, I do a gratitude list every day with my wife. We, we like to walk. And when we're walking, we do a gratitude list. Um, some days it's big events. Some days it's just like, I'm grateful that I had breakfast or that I had shampoo in the shower. Um, a lot of times that's a good way for me to like, if I'm having a really bad day, it's like, wait, things aren't as bad as they seem. Um, it prayer, I, I believe in prayer. So that, um, is something that I do, um, I try to try to build a network of people that are also acknowledging that their mental health is, is important. Um, so having friends or people to talk to, um, exercise is a huge one for me. Um, I grew up in Chicago with the Chicago Bulls. So I love to play basketball. Um, that's my favorite thing. Uh, weights, running, um, any sport, pretty much I can I, I enjoy it. And uh, that I just, I notice if I get an injury and there's a couple days where I'm not exercising, it, my mental health starts to go. Um, so the, the, the hardest part about it's, it's difficult for me because I tell people that mental, emotional, spiritual health is the most important part of health, but it's the hardest one for me to help them with because that, you know, I have my own life experience, which I share in my book and more things that worked for me. Um, but it is different for all of us just because like my therapist to me is amazing and, um, gratitude and exercise work for me, that might not be the right regimen for anybody. And that's kind of what you were talking about earlier is just, just because it's working for one of your friends doesn't mean that's the right thing for you. So the good thing is, is that there's millions of options and it's just, it's like in recovery, step one is just identifying you have a problem. Same thing with like admitting, like I've experienced trauma. And once you do that, you can never kind of look at life the same. It's always going to be in the back of your mind. And then you can start doing things to heal. No, that's so great because I think the important piece, you know, like when people come to see you, they just want to get better and they don't realize that the mental, emotional, spiritual is ab, it's the foundation that if you don't deal with this, everything is not going to get better. And once you deal with that, things start falling in place. I mean, I found this out as a physical therapist 35 years ago yeah. that people got better from chronic pain, but they had to deal with this. Yeah. And so I think that's something amazing. And I love that you bring to the table. It's in your book and that that's part of your practice. And I think yeah. that's just something that, you know, not everybody does. And I think everybody listening, just know it's critical to work on this because as I said, everything, just like you said, everything will start falling in place. Well, oh my gosh, we could talk for so much longer. I, as I said, I just loved reading your book. This is Thank this you. is full of amazing information. I want to try some of the recipes. And for people yeah. that do have SIBO and have to go on a FODMAPS diet, which is limiting, you have some yeah. good recipes. I was yeah. impressed. Yeah. So um, is there any last minute things that you want? I'll have your information and information on the book in the show notes. But is there anything else? Oh, how can people, if people are listening and like, oh my gosh, I want to get in touch with you. Cause yeah. you do do virtual as well. How do, well, how do they, how do they do that? So you can email me through my website, doc dash cause.com. Um, the, my, our phone numbers on there. I have an assistant, her name's Jasmine. She takes all the calls. Um, she answers all the questions that people have. Um, I have a social media page on Facebook. It's Peter Kozlowski MD. And then I have an Instagram page doc dash or excuse me, doc underscore cause um, is my Instagram page, but- And I'll put those in the show notes, all those little all those Thank you. links. Um, so 
emailing us through our website or calling our, our office is the best way to get started and get a hold of us. Great. And is there any last minute things before we end that you want to share? Yeah, I think though, if I could give one, pe one piece of advice to people for their health, it is to stay in the present moment and practice mindfulness. There's a philosopher that said anxiety is worrying about the future. Depression is worrying about the past. So what's the treatment? The present moment. And everything in our society kind of takes us out of the present moment. But the more you can do that, the more you will heal. What a great way to end. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to be here and sharing all your wisdom with all of us. And I think we gained a lot of information from this. So I look forward to staying in touch and yeah. thanks so much. Thank you very much. It was an honor to be with you. Oh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed my interview with Dr. Kaz as much as I did, and now have a better understanding of some additional root causes of osteoporosis and other health issues that might be affecting you. All the links we talked about will be in the show notes, including the link to his really great book, Unfunk with a C, Your Gut. So thanks so much for tuning in, and I look forward to seeing you on the next episode.